I think we're live. Well, hello everyone and good afternoon. Welcome to this panel discussion. My name is Lisa Grace and I will be hosting this discussion this evening on utilizing artificial intelligence to predict future skills. Now, I know we started a little bit late, so I'm gonna go straight into it. On my panel today, I've got Anu and I've also got Passy, and I'm just gonna give them a minute to introduce themselves. So starting with Anu and then moving on to Passy, and then we'll jump into our discussion. Anu. Yes, good afternoon, great being here. And Anu Pastirauste coming from the company called Head AI. We uh, work in this AI field, providing skills data platform. And my role there is in a business development and then doing the, our econo uh, the ecosystem growth. So happy to be here today. Thank you so much. Welcome, Passi. Thank you, Leisa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Passi Tuominen. I come from Haga Heli at University of Applied Sciences. I'm a researcher and a project manager for specifically this uh, artificial inter intelligence project that we are running here in Hagaelia. Fantastic. So good to be here with both of you. I mean, artificial intelligence is transforming the way we do things and the way we live our lives um, from our very cell phones to even the household appliances. So I'm very intrigued today to talk about how we can use this within our schools and within our classrooms and our institutions to predict future skills. So I'm going to go straight away to Passy to talk about what were some of the problems and issues that they had identified at Harbour Heli University to then start looking for solutions. Passy. Thank you. Um, of course, uh, we being the University of Applied Sciences, we want to keep things close to the business and and go uh, and have a continuous discussion with the, with the industry. And uh, it has been going on for several years now, uh, the discussion that how might the future look like? And uh, as, as human beings, we are not that capable of uh, putting linear thoughts and, and, and lots of data into an actionable data. And that those were the seeds for the, the project that perhaps there are ways to gather more information and also analyze large amounts of data that is, uh, you know, humans are not uh, that good in, in, in analyzing. And that was one of the things. And of course, uh, from the industry, we've heard the kind of a similar thoughts that uh, what will, will be the skills that are required in the future? How do the industries change? And are there already signs that could be uh, kind of if we corp incorporate lots of information, can we already see the signs that some areas, for example, or some some industries are taking steps further than we have? And we are not, as educators, we are, we are not necessarily aware of those changes. And, and those were the discussions. And of course, being curious, that, that was one of the things that, uh, that we had the uh, possibility to start uh, this kind of project and, and see how far it could take us and how can we learn and how can we develop in the future, both from the educator's point of view, but also from the, from the uh, student's point of view that they would be better uh, equipped in the future. Fantastic. So what I'm hearing you saying is you had sought the, the use of artificial intelligence to take you further than what human capabilities could take you. All right, so that leads me nicely into going over to Anu because I wanted to find out, having identified the issues and, and the capabilities that you would like to see put in place, how did Head AI go about solving that problem? Yes, thank you. So that is, uh, first of all, the, the baseline that we have a problem to solve and we can take the data and take this data-driven approach to this type of a problem. And um, it is exactly like Vasi mentioned, the, our capabilities to really dig into huge amount of data like labor market, the job applicant ads and, and those type of data. It's, it's impossible for us. It's millions of those when we really want to see in a global scale that what is this skills demand? We have a lot of discussion about that. And what, what are those future skills? Or what are exactly the today's skills? So um, we, we can take that data 
and and use that. Take 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 the algorithms and mechanisms and and machine read the data. So that's what we where we started the collaboration to understand what are those data sources we could use to get this understanding and make this visible. Uh, what what are those data uh, future skills need? So in action, actually, we have taken the job ads from different cities. And, and machine read those and make visibles. What are, when we read, like a human person would read those uh, job applications, what are the skills related to that? And then when we take millions of those and we build a mind map or a knowledge graph on those, that makes it visible. What are actually those skills that pop up? And the same what we can do for the curriculums, for the educational offering, what Haka Helia has. And then once we have those different two different data sets, we can put them together and start to analyze and see what are the similarities and what are the differentiators. So that's actually where we can take the human and accelerate the process. What the human could also do, but it's just time consuming and, and impossible from that perspective. And, and, and start to see those signals or the trends or the similarities. I so think it's exciting. It's about, yeah. So it, it's about cognitive AI, what is we have in, in, in use, and, and that's head AI's uh, own technology. Fantastic. It's it's about expanding the potential. I think at this point, Passy has a video to show us. So I'm going to hand back over to Passy. Yeah, thank you. We will see a visualization. It's a demonstration uh, from something to be released in, in October in Dubai Expo. but. Uh, it will it will kind of visualize our idea of what we call as a crystal ball. It's a kind of a project name for it. But when you see see this uh, demo, uh, you will see the idea behind it. We have five different cities, international job markets that Anu's uh, team has analyzed the open job uh, jobs, and then we have our five different degree program curriculums. And then let's see the video. And as I mentioned, uh, this is a demonstration of holographic displays that will uh, illustrate the amount of data that Head I has um, analyzed, first of all collected and then analyzed. And we have created this uh, kind of a visual interface that uh, all the visitors who are interested in, in, in the future job market skills that, uh, and skill sets that are needed, we have divided them into five different categories. And at the expo, you will be able to kind of analyze and play with the ideas of how does the skill sets required in these five chosen job markets meet the skills that the five degrees at Haga Helia University of Applied Sciences provide. And with, uh, together with uh, Head IE, uh, we have created this visualization, first of all, the global need and global demand, and then again, what are the skills, and they are interactive. And and uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, this is an exploratory kind of approach also. So um, in a sort of way, this is also the discussion starting point for my colleagues here in Haga Helia and with the industry kind of cooperation. Do they see the same similar kind of trends and, and signals? So uh, by visualizing large amounts of data, we can start the discussion and see the dissimilarities and similarities, the things that we already know. That's brilliant. Uh, why, why is the solution and relevant now more than before? So I would say, first of all, we have this qualitative data huge amount of good qualitative data they're existing, what we can use and, and take into this type of a machine analysis. So um, the, the current situation and that data is growing. Also the education data is there to be used and, and in, in a, which, which enables us to do this type of analysis. And I need to say also that the AI and the algorithms have been developed at the same time. So we are coming from this buzzword, uh, so to say that AI is in a, Mm. To, to the actual use, the computational power, 
uh, enables us to do this type of a huge calculation without huge uh, power use. And then I would say also the most critical thing is maybe this dynamic change, the change and even this type of a COVID situation, what we have now, that how do we really uh, can adjust us and then do in, in a more kind of faster way the uh, these type of analyses and, and take that for us as human people as a baseline, like Vasi said, that that's not the truth, that's not the, really the final truth, that's the, what machine can provide us the insight from the data. And then as a human people, we need to do the, the, the decisions based on that. But I would say that there's a lot of things now coming together, which makes this, this type of data-driven approaches and decision-making available also in education field, in, 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 in skills field. So Pasi, why, why has the university gone for this kind of data-driven solution now? Why is it so relevant now? I think the discussion also has changed uh, during the past years that uh, the education should be based on skills and and uh, in order to uh, be able to provide the job market right types of people right types of uh, personalities uh, we need more and more to turn our curriculum development into what skills do we need to teach the students in order to provide and, and and meet the demand from the that's probably the fundamental reason why this is relevant at the moment but also as i mentioned earlier this is this is a journey uh, and uh, it's a kind of a research approach also that 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 we know and and the educational institution has existed for uh, decades and centuries and and the discussion has been going on with the future of uh, the job market already so we know a lot but both us as educators and the industry they would like to know more so that is uh, from the educational point of view can we really uh, be agile like anu mentioned especially during now the past 13 months or whatever uh, the the uh, covid period it, it has required a lot of new skills for the people and an adaptation of of these online environments so in a sort of way are we can we get quicker and can we get uh, ahead of kind of a development so in a sort of way we wouldn't come after the wave when something happens, then we react, but could we be more proactive in, in our kind of curriculum development? So those are the basic things, uh, what kind of the fundamental things, why now? And of course, uh, we are aware that uh, machines get better and better for uh, estimating and kind of analyzing and, and, and uh, drawing the picture of how might the future look like. So in a sort of way, we want to kind of, it's a triangulation keeping contact, close contact and conversation, continuous conversation with the industry, uh, using these kind of uh, new approaches to know even more and also getting a crit kind of a critical perspective also that what does the data say? And then we can interpret it. So it, it is multiple uh, reasons why now. Brilliant. I mean, in schools, we talk a lot about data, but this is a very, very... I think, new way of looking at data from the AI perspective, where the data that we're gathering informs the curriculum, not just looking at student progress and attainment, but looking to the future um, as to what skills the students will need to acquire and, and how much of it is needed for the world of work that they're about to face. Um, I think at this point, I'd love to invite the audience to ask any questions that they may have um, one of the great things about being at the end of any program is that you can run over just a little bit. I hope <laughs> the organizers won't kill me. But um, if you want to stick around afterwards and ask questions of Anu and Passy, then please feel free to do so. Um, we will stick around a little bit after the end of the session so that you can get some of your questions answered because this is such a fascinating topic with the use of artificial intelligence to predict future skills because there's no point in going to school and leaving and not be ready for the the world of work or the job market that awaits so i'm going to go back to um anu and passy but i'll start with passy because i want to talk about the fact that it's already being used at harbour helia 
um, University of Applied Sciences. And I want to know the effectiveness. How effective is it currently with the students, the work that you're doing with Head AI? Uh, yes, uh, that is also one part of the uh, equation in, in a way that uh, now we have a lot of data, but the system or let's say the curriculum development, the general development uh, is a long process and it, it's a kind of a uh, three year intervals that uh, the, the bigger picture will change. So while we are getting the information and, and uh, filtered data and clustered data from head, head IE, it will be the base of the discussion of our kind of a operative, uh, how do we deliver on a daily day basis? So this is for me as a lecturer and my colleagues, a kind of a valuable source of checking to be already, can we meet at least most of the skills needed in, in based on this analysis? So it can be utilized in a day-to-day -day basis and weekly. And, and when, when we develop or kind of a finalize the lectures for a certain course, we can cross-reference uh, already these tables and, and the and the cluster analysis that Head IE has provided us. But also, it's a fundamental tool for the next round of bigger changes. So in a sort of way, if we can come up, uh, because we are in the middle of the process still, so it, it's a continuous thing also, that we can still get new data, especially during the past 13 months, it has been lots of changes in the job market and lots of new skills required. So we need to keep updating the database. And as Anu mentioned that it's not ready and it will probably never be ready because we get more hungry. And then we need, when we realize that we get this and this amount of information and actionable data, then we go, okay, can we get a bit more? And that, that is one thing that, that also we can return or kind of a when when we have set up the goal first for to get the idea of these five uh, degree programs how do the skills provided in these degree programs meet the job markets uh, and that in that pro project we are far and we have kind of a finalized that idea and we can continue updating the data but on the other other hand we have a list of special specific questions uh, which we can return to head eye that can you dig deeper on these kind of a smaller topics uh, which are tailor made and perhaps relates to a certain degree and even a certain uh, uh, course. So in a sort of way, it's an iterative process uh, and we can go back and forth and, and develop develop it further. So, but yes, uh, we with my colleagues, we've gone through the uh, lists and then and, and, and the clusters and seeing how well are we already up to date and, and what do we still need. So uh, there's multiple different kind of a perspectives. So it's a process that it's cyclical, keeps going. It is, um, it is. I know. How, how effective has this process been working with Helga Helia and, and digging into that data? Yes, this is a uh, first of all excellent journey together and goal learning, as Pasi mentioned. So that's what we value also that there is we, we are not yet there. And and I would say that it, that's all in all AI field that this is a uh, continuous iteration and it, the data is also showing us something that we didn't even uh, thought to ask. And 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 that's the interesting thing. So. I would say that the effectiveness comes that we can take the data in different, so to say, silos into action. That we might not have thought that uh, in education we, we can really take this external data and use that and do the conversations or simulations. So first of all, that is a technical problem to, what we have solved, that how to make these different data sets, even though they are in a different culture, in different context, uh, and still make it interoperable. So that is the interesting thing when we think about that. The, the data, is, we don't, when we speak about education data and labor market data, those are totally different. And there can't be any kind of ontologies or hierarchies or ways that we say that, hey, 
in Dubai, you write like that, uh, job ads, and in Finland, you do that type of education programs, descriptions, so that they really connect to each other. So this multiple kind of layers, what we need to think about in order to to make that happen, that we can really do the, the simulations in between education data, people's data, students' data, teachers' data, and, and those type of things. So, um, and... And then so so to say that that's that's a really there is a lot of things going in parallel and and also what is interesting that as you say that they, they now it's it's asking them to to look their curriculum data and of course that's a continuous process it's always been but also this is pushing the companies now and organizations that are we talking about titles how do we write those job ads so that it makes sense if we are now doing this collaboration and this data driven collaboration and taking those insights, then we also need to think, look at those ads, at what's actually there. And and if we then now push the whole kind of ecosystem to us, that students are now, they are analyzing that, okay, I'm not I'm not going to be in a title. I'm not, uh, my career is not about title. It's about the skills. It's about a lot of skills. And there I'm interested to kind of see what are those different data. So how do we do this in ecosystem, all these different actors together. And, and that's what we see that this, even though when we talk about skills gap problem, that's, that can't be solved in any silo. In, in let's say in education field or in, in a labor market field or in uh, people's or companies, or it, it, it's this a common, common area what we need to do together and, and, and really um, learn together also in this process. Um, I want to take it, thank you so much. I really want to take it to the level of um, the audience and where we are and think of our personal institutions. So the majority of the people watching this um, webinar are educators. And so I wanted to find out from yourselves, how do you think other institutions can use this, this solution to drive forward change within their institutions, whether that be secondary schools or universities, etc. Um, I'll start with Patsy and then I'll go on to Anu. Uh, yeah, this, this is uh, very close to my heart and, and, and I have background in hospitality and tourism industry and I've led organizations with 100, uh, 120 kind of people and, and then uh, the individual skills and development has been the kind of a very very close to my my background and and, and of course i've gone through that path also so what i see uh, as a really good possibility for any educational institution uh, regardless of the level is is how could uh, artificial intelligence uh, improve or um, kind of a make it easier for an individual student to first of all see the potential what might be my future <laughs> after I graduate and uh, so in a sort of way working together the machine or kind of an artificial intelligence and an individual student would kind of have this continuous discussion that uh, these are my goals at the moment and the system would kind of uh, make it possible to see that there are multiple paths to take within this institution. These are the courses that would benefit you in achieving the goal. And it would be uh, continuous learning and in a kind of a way discussion that, okay, now I've done this and my goal has kind of changed a bit. So the artificial intelligence would uh, be pos uh, able to amend or kind of a change mm -hmm. or kind of a correct uh, okay now you want to do this and actually the job market also has changed a bit so perhaps you could take this road instead so kind of an individual learning path development or kind of a guidance mm -hmm. because now I, I i believe that in the audience also there's lots of tutors and and student counselors who are doing it manually so sometimes it might be, and I can imagine that it is overwhelming to be aware of all each individual student's capabilities, aspirations, uh, wishes, goals, and whatever uh, they want to do. So utilizing artificial intelligence in this kind of situation, I, I see that as a huge potential. Mm -hmm. 
both for the students sake of view and and for the industry view and and also it would lessen the burden from from the student counselors <laughs> that's exciting it's exciting to think that you could sit down with your student counselor in year 11 or 12 or 13 and using artificial intelligence they could show you several pathways that you could take and the demand for it and even the future demand for it exciting stuff i know how can institutions use this solution yeah i totally agree with Bossy with this more personalized and adaptive things that uh, we where we could take these um ais to help in in a do this scenario playing for the students, but also the teachers and and, and different levels, kind of allowing these scenarios, different scenarios. If I go on that uh, tool, what states this goal? What does it mean? And then how it affects, what should I take into account? But then um, also, and and that's actually, when we think about uh, uh, these type of tools, it should allow us to have this human uh, time and, and and resources for those more hard questions and then the basic questions we can be led for the AIs and machines. So in that sense, that is a very relevant thing. But I also think about these different levels of organization, education institutions, that giving these dashboards for also the deans and, and the head of schools or the different units to kind of uh, get this insight. What are we doing? What's there? How do we... Um, so to say, match with the, with our goals. And even what is interesting nowadays, what we have doing this, having the binary, binary class for a kind of a longer, more um, in a long run, in a horizon, that, for example, there is um, SDG, are those global goals, and it's in a many education organizations strategy. So how can we take those and make it measurable? that how do we really actually score against those go, uh, those SDGs, which we have, might, might, might take in, as in, our, in our strategy. So I would say that it's, it's kind of a, this mapping in, in different levels, making things visible to help us in decision making or the guidance or making the, 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 um, the viewpoints. And then also it's, it's type of a taking a compass for again in different levels and, and then looking for kind of a more near and then more to the far further. Thank you. I, at some point, I think around about now, there should be a poll coming up on your screen. So if that comes up, please um, take part in that. Um, and we'd love to kind of see what your feedback is. Do you think artificial intelligence could play, could play an integral role in helping to design the curriculum in your school? So um, lots and lots of people are saying yes, and some people are saying maybe, but we'll keep that poll up there and keep your questions coming because we're going to spare some time at the end of this session to go through the questions and answer as many of them as we possibly can. I see some questions that they're waiting for me um, to throw to our ABLE panel and Nguyen Passi, so prepare yourselves. Those are coming. Um, but I wanted to, wanted to kind of go a little bit into our crystal balls, if you if you like, and look at the way forward. Um, what does the future look like for AI, and and how do you see the solution evolving and helping and shaping and molding the future? So I'll start with you, Anu. How do you see it growing and, and evolving? I would say that we are so used that in our pocket and in our mobile phones, it's it's there. When we look to TV or movies, we are so used to get those recommendations. So I would say that it's coming also in this in education field. That, uh, but then we need to be careful also that the, the same approaches or methods can be used. We I think it's we don't want to get educated on those topics that you, Lisa, would be educated only, but more on kind of our own pers- personalized uh, background. What, what we have, what is the path we have gone so far, and also what are, what are our interests. So I would see that this type of a personalized recommendation suggestions is really coming to this field. And we just need to be careful on that, that what are the kind of baseline, what is the baseline on those recommendations? How is this machine built? And an understanding also these kind of issues that it's not a black box. There is always a human person who has been developing those uh, yeah. algorithms. So it's we'll talk about that in a minute. But yeah, yeah. definitely. It's not magic. It's not magic. So, and it won't yeah, solve so, everything. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, no. And, and it's, it's always, it's, it's a specific issues. And 
And if looking to the future, I think the most critical thing is that we keep asking the questions. We we have the the problems what we want to solve, and then also thinking that what what where this can help us as human people. Thank you, thank you so much, Passy. What is what does the future look like for AI within within the education space? Um, I would like to take a, a leap to the far future and, and in a sort of way see the situation where where individual learning capabilities or learning styles uh, disabl- disabilities uh, could be lessened or kind of a, uh, it could help uh, in a sort of way the artificial intelligence could be the, the provider of, uh, of uh, different if you have a sub- subject, we've had this idea for a kind of a research project. If we have a, a subject A, and then we have multiple different personalities, uh, learning styles, uh, some people might have uh, disabilities that uh, make it harder to uh, harder to learn things. How about having uh, the kind of a same subject A? translated into multiple different languages whether it's sign language or whether it's different languages like like we know but also adjusting the style of the delivery of the subject a uh, to suit the the audience or individuals uh, within a group so in a sort of way i would say that the the future will be uh, in the future we will see at least examples and 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 these kind of a crazy prototypes of these kind of uh, environments where artificial intelligence is constantly solving these challenges or research questions that Anu was uh, mentioning, but also rapidly and very in an agile way, adapting the delivery of education to individuals which have already been not analyzed, but... but uh, grouped based on their learning styles and, and, and uh, capabilities of learning and, and acquiring the information. So I would see the, these kind of things beyond the ones that Anu already mentioned and we discussed earlier, earlier that going further into the uh, enabling personal development and then and, and being more and more personalized, well, kind of a, uh, providing more and more personalized uh, education. So I would think uh, there is a short term or kind of a very near future. We will see these personalized solutions, which are helped and and, and uh, enabled by artificial intelligence. But in the future, I would even see uh, even crazier uh, solutions that would be like yeah. part of us. But I think we will have to discuss about one thing also. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I'm not ready for the chip in my arm just yet. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, but, but, um, I, but yes, go ahead, Anu. Yeah, I, I, I would really see that it, it's, it's connecting different uh, uh, topics, what Pasi mentioned, that in a personal level, but it, it really makes the possibility to connect the global and local, that when we are in a certain context, what is the relevant here? And it really taking even us as, an, as a human people with different angles and aspects into account. But then connecting the global, all the opportunities, education uh, providers, materials, mentors, peoples to each other. So that when we have a question, there, there can be different kind of uh, um, solutions for that. And then when we are even there was, I think there was a question about re- virtual rea- reality. So one day I, I can imagine that it's, it's in a, it's a space where we can and connect everything to to us and hopefully still meet people face to face. Yeah, brilliant. I I, I think the possibilities are, are really endless when it comes to AI, but I want to balance the conversation just a little bit because we've painted a really good picture of AI, but there are issues concerning AI um, and its use, the ethics behind it, the privacy, the surveillance the bias, the discrimination, because we're talking about machines and they're not infallible. Um, What are are some of the issues that we need to be aware of concerning AI or that you've noticed in your work, your research at university and at Head AI? Let's let's start with Anu. What are some of those issues? 
Yeah, as I already said, that it's AI is not magic, really. That understanding that it is a calculation, it's mathematics, it's uh, an analytics, and then it it doesn't need to be, and it's not a black box. So everything what we get there out is is should be explainable and transparent. In that sense that we know what is the baseline, wh- why why these results, why why do we get uh, this type of recommendation? So I, I would really take that into account and and also who owns the data and when we are going to the people skills data I think that's very crucial that we also think about that um, especially those biases is what we have we know but that um, it's it's people's own data and there's interesting approaches also going on like Finland is leading a lot in this my data human centric data approach and um, so I think it's mentioned actually earlier today that the most critical thing is critical thinking. That and we have this media literacy. That it's actually that's what we need to have. There's no truth, and and we need to be aware of those and then take them always into the discussion and and not saying that if there's something funny or something weird, just kind of ignore it. But start mm. the discussion. Where does it comes from? And have these active discussions together and develop things together also. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Passy. Um, I would so also say, and I o- already wanted to kind of mention that, of course, we are picturing because this is a, have been our project and we've been interested in, in looking how far we can take it. But also we have taken into account and we've had several discussions and lots of memos of, of uh, who owns the data, like Anna was mentioning, but what what are we doing with the data? How can we analyze it, and who is the um, who has the right to make the final decision? So, in a sort of way, we've had discussions, and we've had uh, in the news, we've seen press releases that in a artificial intelligence has taken a place in the boardroom. So, in a sort of way, uh, it has been introduced in several different. Uh, forums and and like in the educational world or in the business world uh, companies are using artificial intelligence but uh, we have to keep it in that kind of a role of a servant and in a sort of way keep the final decisions the analysis and in the sort of way like Anu was describing that we have to ask the question from the machine and then we provide the data or show where to get the data from. And then it will do the mathematic calculation and and, 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 and estimation and using the statistical models and, and the algorithms that the uh, head eye has, for example, uh, created. But then the final step has to be taken by the human being. So in a sort of way, yes, it's an enabler and it provides a lot of opportunities but we had to be treated carefully in a way. And, and that has been kind of a, a leading leading idea for us also, especially in the educational environment where we almost all of the uh, data uh, is related to human beings and, and how what, what kind of skills they have. And especially the scenario that I was picturing that, is very far away and there's lots of things that has to be sorted out from the security and ethical point of view before we are even get get to the prototype so it was just uh but it, it's also good to know that what what lies behind and in a sort of way if we just go there and uh, raise our hands and yeah everything is nice and and it's amazing and and then keep hyping about it sometimes we have to stop and discuss seriously about these issues that Lisa you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's important. You made a very, very good point. AI is the servant and we have to keep it in that role. It's not the master. It doesn't dictate to us. We utilize the data as we see fit and it serves us. And we have to keep it that way. We have to keep the human element at the forefront of everything that we do. Brilliant discussion. Lovely, lovely talking to you. I'm going to take some of the questions that we have down here. I know it's now past the time, but if you guys want to hang out with us just a little bit, we'll we'll see what some of the questions are. Um, the first question is, how will artificial 
general intelligences challenge traditional education systems and practice, um, and that was upvoted. So, how will how will the how will AI challenge the traditional way of educating the practices that we're very used to right now? How will AI change that? I can I can try. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I can try uh, because I, I have this idea in my mind that especially now when we are uh, developing and, and providing online courses. And then uh, on the other hand, uh, we have the content production. So we, as lecturers, we create quizzes, we uh, assignments, and we provide slides or videos or whatever lecture type we want to do. And then we place them in a platform which automatically uh, provides the courses and the content step by step to the student. So in that sense, there might be a challenge, uh, or kind of a, the situation that the, quest, uh, the question asked, is there a, how it challenges the traditional way of doing? Because when we do that, although it's created by us, the lecturers and, and the experts, the material, the quizzes, everything is, is produced by us, but then the rest is between the, the probably the, a, a computer platform or software platform and the student and they negotiate the timeline and the pace that they go and then every most of the other things are automated and at the end you have passed all the steps and then passed all the quizzes or whatever assigns, uh, assignment has been done so in that sense we already have those platforms where it's not necessarily the, the artificial intelligence as such, but it is the logic is same. And in the future, we might see that the adaptive learning system might take more role in these kind of environments. But from the, from the traditional ex cathedra uh, learning and teaching, someone is te teaching and in front of the uh, students, I wouldn't say that artificial intelligence challenge is that much. I, I would also add an approach that if we think about now the skilling and and then also the all the offering what we have available on a web, how does this uh, challenges our education systems and the schools offering? That if if we think that now students or we can learn actually anything from YouTube or any type of things, and 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 we are talking about this upskilling, reskilling, and skills based. So should we actually validate and, and take into account those skills people already have gained? And now Pasi said that we can automate even the evaluation or we can make visible that, okay, I actually can have got those skills in my work or I have done those short courses there and there. So how do we take this into account that students might have really a different background and we want to do this adaptive uh, learning path for them and it's we we can see that they have already created their learning path by themselves so what do they actually learn in the schools how do we do can we give a one course for everybody when they if we could take this this kind of a background into account that and and there's not any more degrees we are actually looking into kind of a smaller skills that is actually something that uh, the uh, global educational alliances are talking about about badges for example you have a variety of different small courses or uh, bits and pieces and then you get like in a game or in the boy scout you get a badge in your and when you have the full set then you can kind of uh, claim for a degree or kind of a certificate of i've done all these and then i have done it by myself with with a online platform. So in a sort of way, there are already signs, signs for that kind of a development. I like that. I like that idea. I mean, obviously, I, I think we're a way away from it, but the fact that you can carry on learning and every time you learn, you earn yourself, you know, an online badge, so to speak, and it all adds into your your skills portfolio, your learning portfolio, and it journeys with you throughout your life. So at 60, I could decide, you know what, I'm going to hop online and learn how to code, and it's going to add to my badge. 
I'm loving that idea. Let's take another question here. There was a question about um, artificial intelligence. In t- what do you think the role of virtual reality will, what do you think the role will be in transforming education? I think that one is a little bit sideways of our realm. So I might leave that one for today. But here's a question. Can you trust machines to decide about the future skills of humans? I would take the year to approach it. What is the data we are using for this forecasting? So what are the baseline data? What is this input data we give for the machine? And, and that needs to be reliable and enough broad and, and from qualitative sources and trustable sources so that we can say that, hey, that, that is one one view to the uh, skills future or so so it's it's not again it's not about magic that the, what the ai is reading we are the we are the per- people who who give the data for the machine and that's our role to really broadly look and carefully think about what type of a data we use for different analyses I think it's a brilliant question, and and like in any research, I, I would say that it's a fundamental question: Can we trust the results? And and then and it goes back to the: Are we asking the right kind of questions? Uh, second, uh, are we using the right uh, kind and and proper data? So, have we asked the right question? Have we asked the right question from right persons or right group of people? Uh, and, and then how have we analyzed? Is it transparent? Are the algorithms or the statistical models proven somewhere else? So in a sort of way, it's like any research pro, uh, process that you have to bear in mind the trustworthiness and, and, and the, the quality of all the steps that you are taking. But yeah, it's a valid question. Yeah. I think we'll just take the final two questions for this evening. Um, The first one is, how can schools begin the transformation process to meet the expectations of this for the skills needed among students being based, sorry, among students based on utilizing AI? So how can schools begin the transformation process based on on the expected um, skills? Anu, would you like to start with this? Mm. So uh, I, I would say that they, taking those kind of a, a learning journey, take it as in a learning journey, that it's not judging. It's not uh, making uh, scores in that sense that they, are we doing right or wrong, but may, taking it as in a tool to help us on, on those uh, in this transformation that we want to get these signals, insights, to help us make the decisions. And um... and I think uh, if I jump yeah. in from here, I think it's about uh, general awareness uh, of the availability of uh, higher power or kind of a, a power meaning as a computer power and calculating power and this kind of data analysis. So in a sort of way, uh, we can approach this question also from the two sides that uh, building the awareness of the students now and in the future that that uh, artificial intelligence can help them to develop and be aware of the possibilities. But also uh, from the educator's point of view that uh, I don't have to make the decisions by myself. I don't have to analyze all the data in the world which I'm not able to access, but I can have and I can utilize these kinds of tools in the, in the future. So in a sort of way, it's a two-way story. That, uh, general awareness of the possibilities uh, is, a, I, I would say, a good approach. First start discussing, finding out uh, different examples, how it has been utilized in in educational environment or educational institution, but also in the business world, and then building from that. Yeah. Um, And the final question says, what kinds of data um, do schools need to provide for the companies crunching the actual data? So I guess for you, you, Hadahelia, you're providing HEDAI with the data. What kinds of data are you providing? Um, Mostly... uh, yeah, basically, what we had done in have done in this pro, uh, project 
was uh, was the descriptions of uh, of the curriculum uh, of five different degrees, and then from the kind of a underlying level, uh, the content of the courses. So, uh, what skills and knowledge is distributed in each course underneath a degree? So it's it's a written written data. But at the moment, I am in this project, nothing else. Yeah, it's existing descriptions. What I I suppose every every education provider has that they have described. What what are their targets, objectives, how they are teaching, and and what is the overall topics of each course? So that's that has been the baseline what we have used. Thanks for okay. data. So can you to wrap everything up? Just tell the audience how they can connect with you to learn more about what you're doing, or if they if they want to just connect with you to ask further questions. I know. <laughs> Definitely, we are interested to. I, I think this this world hasn't been solved, and, and I said in the beginning, this is an ecosystem, and we globally we need to work on this together. Um, please connect me via, via Twitter, Anu Passi, or just uh, email, and uh, and hopefully if we can see you in Dubai. <laughs> so that's of course the interesting, most interesting. There you could touch <laughs> this hologram and and learn these things together. But yeah, any any uh, any channels works. Happy to talk more. Thank you. And for me also, I'm I'm happy happy to talk uh, the possibilities and, and of course the challenges. When this hasn't been a walk in the park or dance on the roses, it has been has many 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 faces. So in a sort of way, I'm I'm really happy to discuss anyone with anyone who would like to take the first steps uh, into this kind of uh, idea. And um, you can reach me from the bio. You you will find. Uh, the email and the LinkedIn profile, and then Haga Helia is very known in Finland. You can easily Google me <laughs> from Helsinki, and I will see you if you come to Dubai in October. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anu. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Passy. My name is Lisa Grace Wilson. If you want to connect with me, I, I I'm not an AI specialist, but you can find me on LinkedIn, Lisa Grace Wilson, or you can connect with me at Teach Middle East Magazine. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye-bye.